John and I had many conversations about his relationship with Paul McCartney. And I do recall a Christmas we shared at the Dakota uh, when Paul and Linda came to visit. Um, and we went out to Elaine's uh, to have something to eat and came back to the house and spoke for an hour or two. Um, theirs was a long, well, to quote a phrase, a long and winding road. And there was a multitude of emotions and experiences that went down. However, in terms of what John told me at the end of his life, all of the issues um, between him and Paul McCartney had been resolved in his mind. And that when uh, John's time ran out, uh, based upon what he told me, there was no bitterness, there was no anger, there was no anything of a negative nature directed at Paul McCartney. No, no, my memories are now all fond and the wounds are healed and if we do it, we do it. If we record, we record. I don't know. It, as long as we make music. You know. And there's no hard feelings to any member of the group or anything? No, nobody in particular. <laughs> no. Is, it, is there truth to that story that they were sitting in the Dakota when Lauren Michaels, I think George was a guest, is there, can you tell that, did you know that we were around for that? I was, and I was in tell, the... Paint a picture for me of what's going on, because it's a crazy, I may not get Paul to agree to interview for this film, which would break my heart. Paul, you really should do Well, you uh, can call him up and tell him to do it, but, uh, but let's say I don't. Can you paint a picture for me of this moment? Um, one night, keep in mind that most of the times that I spent with John and Yoko was in the Dakota building in their bedroom. There was this white wicker rocking chair to the right of their bed. That's where I sat, they were in bed, and we would talk through the night, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours. And uh, there was a television set at the front of the bed. The bed was, uh, there were two old church pews with a piece of quarter inch plywood that reached the two pews with a mattress on top of it. That was their bedroom. And John always had this large screen TV on. We bought it when, he bought it when we were in Japan. It was the first large screen TV that entered the United States under questionable circumstances with respect to customs. When John had his glasses off, he couldn't see anything. The TV was always on because he described it to me as an electronic fireplace. So it just looked like, you know, a fireplace at the end he of the bed. He loved to have the TV on. He loved to have the TV on, but keep in mind from his perspective when the glasses were off, it would be like you and I loving to have a fireplace at the foot of our bed. It wasn't as if he said, hang on, I, w I want you, you know, to watch. It was kind of like white noise in the background, right? It was white noise, and it was a visual effect. He wasn't saying, "I want you to see this episode of Law and Order, or Columbo, or whatever it was." He didn't watch a lot of television except the news. But one night, while I was in the wicker chair, he was telling me about the fact that the previous Saturday, Lauren Michaels had created this skit where. Um, Saturday Night Live offered, I think, something like $375 for a Beatles reunion to take place on Saturday Night Live. And um, if memory serves, there was something about they would pay for a hotel that had an ice maker in the hallway. You know, everything would be covered. And this at a time when they were getting crazy offers to get back. Multi-million dollar offers for the Beatles to have a reunion. And that's why I said, and I did the, the skit. John told me he was in bed, he was watching it live. He was giggling. He thought it was, uh, you know, just a very funny skit. And then I said to him,
did you give it any thought? And he said, I really did. He said, and he said, I was going to call George. And of course, the Beatle that he talked to me about the most, that I believe he loved the most, was Ringo. Because all of his reflections and thoughts in all of our conversations always went back to Richard. Uh, I mean, he really loved Richard. Uh, so I was surprised that he called George. Uh, he was up for it. If he got a, a green light from any of the others, there is no doubt in my mind he was 20 blocks away from Rockefeller Center and would drive down there and say, you know, let's do it. So could it have happened? Sure. The great if only. Um, when he went to Bermuda, and we're going to interview Tyler, who was the boat captain. And the I met him. Great guy. It's a great, crazy story. <coughs> did John ever, how did John let you know that he was starting? When you, as you point out, he was always sort of singing to Sean, so it wasn't that he had not had music in his life. But how did he let you know that music was professionally going to start to be a part of his life again? He, ca he called me from Bermuda. And he said, uh, you know, he told me about the whole sailing ship story. He later um, introduced me to Tyler. We drove out to Rhode Island or Long Island or wherever Tyler was. He took me aboard the boat. Uh, it, it was freezing. Uh, it was, uh, you know, he, he showed me where he, I don't know anything about apps and I don't know the front of the boat from the back of a boat or how you work a yacht or if it's called a steering wheel or whatever. But John took great pride in walking me around the whole thing, showed me where he was holding the wheel and how the masts came down. I mean, it was just, he had told me the story, but now he was demonstrating it to me. Um, from Bermuda, he said, look, all the songs came to me within a period of about a week. I think there were seven or eight songs. I called Mother. And Mother was in New York, and she was composing her own songs. And they would share their songs with each other over the telephone. There is no doubt in my mind, if I might be allowed a personal observation for which there is no foundation, Go right ahead. no support material here, no evidence, no tape. But I think that there was something of a magical, spiritual, mystical event that occurred as John was on that ship when that ship hit the stormy waves and there was serious risk that the thing would sink, that he was able to get through the storm, reach an island, and be greeted by the muse. And what he learned from the trip, he transmitted back to us with Yoko in Double Fantasy. John Lennon was a nostalgic, romantic man. He was more that than a severe rock and roller. He was more at home in his uh, robe and uh, slippers than he was in black leather trying to be Elvis. He was a softy. He was publicly uh, caustic and you know, all of those things. But if you, if you wanted to get to the real essence of him, and you just didn't have the good fortune that I did of knowing both of them, if you listen to the songs that really counted in his life, like Jealous Guy and like Help and like uh, Mother, and I could probably name five or six others, Forget about all the other stuff. If you want to know John, um, put aside all the multi-tracks. Go to the roots. Go to the heart. He was the first rock and roll artist who took off the makeup, cut off the dividing line between performer and audience, 
and said, keep in mind, when Yoko heard help, she heard John. When John said that he was a jealous guy, what he was doing was he was sharing the essence of himself with those of us who now, 40 years later, are talking about him. He was, he's just talking to people of his experience. That's why this is so meaningful. I, I understand when people watch, you know, biographies and there's always a tendency to make people look a little, you know, more profound and bigger than they actually were in life. It makes for hotter television. The fact is with John, there wasn't a distinction between show business and reality, between John Lennon, the public persona, and the guy who you would meet and spend time with if he invited you up to the house to talk with. Of the 2,000 people I interviewed, he was the one where there was no distinction, zero. He would wear a medal uh, uh, on his lapel that said, I prefer it in mono. Can you dig it? There's a great thing, hearing Elton Nelson told a story of uh, John walking down the street with the Beatlemania pub in <laughs> yeah. 64, uh, I love Paul. <laughs> And somebody said to him, why are you wearing that button? He said, well, because I love Paul. Um, I'm going to talk over this plane. I have two more questions for you. One is... Uh, I know the last one. Well... So uh, let me hear the first one. What was John thinking about at that moment that Double Fantasy came out? It was pretty well received. People were buying it. There must have been a heavy ebullience to it. What were the plans? Was it, was, was it true that they were thinking they were going to do a tour and that they were going to record more? Or was he thinking, okay, that's it. I'm going to go back now to Sean. I'm done with this music. In my last conversations with him... <clears throat> Don't um, say in your last conversations. Okay. In conversations with him. Don't give away the... In conversations with him after he had completed Double Fantasy, there was so much excitement, effusiveness in his voice. He was so pleased with the way that album turned out, you know? He wanted to go on a limited tour we're not talking 87 cities, you know, with 14 747 airplanes and sets and Lady Gaga explosives. He wanted to just go on a limited tour with Yoko and share this music. Um, he felt renewed, restored. Um, whatever had eluded him for a number of years before Double Fantasy tapped him on the shoulder again. And John and Yoko were as pleased as could be, and they were ready. They were pumped. They were primed. Yeah. There was a great sense of anticipation to everything that was going to come. And Sean would have gone with him on the bus. Yeah, sure, why not? And John by his kids go with him. I mean, you know. <coughs> All right, so. I know, I know, yeah. okay. I know. Here you go. Here's how the most, most of America found out. Uh, I sat in Chicago and I heard somebody say on television, an unspeakable tragedy confirmed to us by ABC News in New York City. John Lennon outside of his apartment building on the west side of New York City, the most famous perhaps of all the Beatles, shot twice in the back rushed to Roosevelt Hospital. Dead on. What do you want to know? Where? When? Whatever?
Give or take, it was around 7 o'clock in the evening uh, California time. I was living in Laurel Canyon. Um, a friend of mine called me and said that uh, he had just heard something on the news about a shooting in New York um, on 72nd Street in front of the Dakota building. The friend was my mother. Well, uh, Mom didn't call uh, I'm a New Yorker. I know if they're going to interrupt the evening's programming or a football game with a bulletin that there was a shooting on 72nd Street near D the Dakota. Uh, that it was not um, something that was random. I just knew. I thanked my mother and I got off the phone and uh, I packed a couple of shirts, uh, called American Airlines, booked flight 10, 10 p.m. departure. At that time it was the last flight at, from LA to New York direct. I booked a seat, I got into my car and I drove to the airport. My car radio didn't work. I had an old car. I uh, got on the plane not hearing the news. So you genuinely did not know? Or you didn't want to know? The radio was broken in my old car. But you knew enough to get on the plane that night. My mother told me that they had put a bulletin on the New York News during a football game that there was a shooting on 72nd Street in front of the, the Dakota building. I did not need to know more information. I boarded flight 10 at 10 p.m. Uh, from uh, LA uh, to New York. I was on the plane for 10 minutes, just made that flight, and uh, as I sat in the cabin, uh, two flight attendants uh, walked out of the um, the place where the pilots are, and both of them were in tears. And I looked at them and I said, I looked at one of them and I said, are, are you okay? And she said, uh, no, they, they just killed John Lennon. That's when and where I learned. I had five hours alone in the cabin of the plane. Quietly to process that reality and then to, d to determine what I was going to do when I landed. Do you remember I, what you felt at that moment? <laughs> I felt the biggest loss of my life. I felt the loss of um, a man I considered to be my best friend and a brother. And um, I did my grieving silently. And as the captain announced that we were about to land at JFK, my only thought, my only thought was for me to just be there for Yoko and Sean, to be as supportive as I can, and do what I could. That was it. The plane landed, called a cab. The cab brought me to the front of the Dakota building. It was early morning. We all know what I witnessed. I went up the elevator. 
I will forever be haunted by having crossed the crime scene with the yellow tape and seeing John's blood on the ground and stepping over the broken glass and going up the elevator and um, somebody opening the door and saying that Yoko was in the bedroom. I walked to the bedroom and uh, <laughs> and I knocked on the door and I said, uh, Yoko, it's Elliot. I'm here and when you'd like, um, I'll come inside. And I sat down in the hallway, the little hallway that led to the bedroom where we had shared all this time together. And after um, less than 15 minutes, she opened the door. We hugged. I would spend um, the next weeks or months in New York with her, dealing with the process of disengagement emotionally, spiritually, physically, criminally. Is it not something you ever grow accustomed to, though, is it? I mean, 30 years on. It doesn't, don't get the sense that for Yoko, for anybody, really, that the pain has. You may learn to forgive. You will never learn to forget. And that would be a hollow teaching. It is important to remember. It's important to repeat. It's important for this tale to be told. And it's important for me to remember that moment in time. Right. And Yoko, her sense of <coughs> what you saw, how what she was. I mean, I don't. She'll talk to us about what she was going through, but uh, there's this. The hardest thing I ever read about John's death was what Sean had given to a recent biographer sort of just feeling alone. Running into his bed. Crying. I sat in the old white wicker chair next to her. The sun was coming up on December 9th, 1980. And all we could hear were the sounds of the people singing the songs from downstairs. And the Dakota, this old Gothic cacophonous building, I think the oldest apartment building in Manhattan, gave the sounds a certain kind of reverberation. So you would just, the sounds would be magnified. I wanted to honor her silence. I wanted her to be aware of my presence and my support. There were no words then. There are no words now. I remember Julian telling that story about the feather floating. And I know and believe it was very real for Julian. In all these years, I don't think I've ever said this before, and just know that I'm a, a person who believes in the cosmic experience and I'm a person who believes in tarot and mediumship 
and God and messages. In all these years, I've never heard from John in any of those ways. I have my own belief systems as to where he is, what he can hear and what he can't. And I want to believe that John's in a better place. What is important to me and will always be important to me is how Yoko and Sean will be throughout the rest of their lives with respect to these questions. I don't have to have a message or confirmation from John that I don't need a hello or a goodbye. You know, <coughs> he, he, he gave me um, more than I w could ever ask for. I was just privileged to have known him. When I think back and try to isolate a moment in time of my relationship with John and Yoko, um, of what I carry with me and treasure. Uh, John and Yoko lived in an apartment uh, uh, in the Dakota building and there was another apartment adjacent to theirs and they purchased it. And it was an empty apartment. And uh, John one day decided to call it the Club Dakota. And Elton John bought him a jukebox. And uh, John and I went out shopping in Greenwich Village to find 78 RPM records to put in this great old Wurlitzer to play. And we went downtown and we found uh, everybody from Johnny Ray to Edith Piaf to Carl Perkins to Elvis to... We filled the jukebox and we designed and decorated this little apartment. We found uh, old uh, pink flamingos in a, 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 a store somewhere and a couch and uh, eight or nine objects. And he said, uh, we're going to have the opening of the Club Dakota. It's a very private club. There are only three members right now. You, me, and Yoko. And you better be on your best behavior. And, um, and what year is it? Hmm. Ish. I think around 1976 or 1977. And uh, he said we should dress for the opening of the Club Dakota. And um, we decided it would be a formal opening. And John wore. Um, his old Liverpool school tie and a black jacket. I dressed the same. He asked that I prepare a written invitation and deliver it on a silver platter to Mother to attend this opening, which would be on New Year's Eve. I did. Uh, we hooked up the jukebox, uh, some lava lights, um, you know, some <laughs> really questionable decorations in this apartment they acquired. And uh, Yoko appeared at 11 p.m., dressed exquisitely. And the snow was falling. And the windows looked out over Central Park. And uh, she arrived and he welcomed her in. And um, we spent um, an hour or so in the Club Dakota. He handed me a Polaroid camera and he said, please snap some uh, pictures of Mother and I. And he pushed the Wurlitzer and played some music. 
And the two of them danced together. And in the background, you could see a Central Park in the snow. And they embraced. And of the years I've spent with them, that visual and that image of that night on New Year's Eve at the Club Dakota is the one that I carry with me in my heart and my soul. It's a beautiful image.